So hi, everyone. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda, and I'm here with my co-host. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Karina. Glad to be here with you guys today. So today we're going to be discussing malaria research with a special guest and then discussing an evidence-based intervention from Ghana. But first and foremost, we'd like to introduce the special guest joining us, Dr. Miriam Laufer, who is also a fellow TERP. So hello, Dr. Laufer. Welcome to the show. We are glad to have you here today. Thank you for meeting with us. Would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am Dr. Miriam Laufer. I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician by training. And um, I've really committed most of my life to malaria research. I run the malaria research program as part of the Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health at the University of Maryland School of Medicine in Baltimore. And um, most of my focus is on create developing creative strategies to prevent malaria using drugs, vaccines, community approaches, um, to try and get rid of this infection that's really been here since before humans even existed. Yep, that's amazing, Rick. We have some questions for you about your work and research. Would you be willing to speak on that a little bit? Of course, my favorite topic. (laughs) Aside from talking about my kids, but you don't want to hear about them, so let's go. (laughs) So our first question is, what sparked your interest in public health and more specifically the research of malaria? And did you come upon it in college or later on? That's a great question. So um, I actually started out in college. I majored in public policy and I thought I was going to go and become a physician who was interested in health policy sort of domestically trying to figure out how to design health systems to serve underserved populations here in the U.S. I ended up spending a summer following around a young doctor in Ecuador was my initial goal was just to make sure that I learned Spanish really well. And I came to realize that, you know, she was actually an incredibly impressive human being. And she had a textbook, a stethoscope around her neck and about 10 medicine medications in the pharmacy. And she had to take care of everyone. And um, I thought to myself, you know what, I really want to figure this out. I want to figure out how when resources are limited, we could provide the best possible care for patients in a way that is applicable in large populations. So that was really my where I got interested in global public health. Mm-hmm. Um, I subsequently um, finished medical school, became a pediatrician, and then spent a year working in Laos in Southeast Asia, where there were a lot of children with fever without a known source of the fever. Many of them, it turns out, had malaria, and I got very interested in malaria and decided that that's what I wanted to do my research on, both because of its big public health importance and also because it's a difficult nut to crack. It's a really fascinating infection. Mm -hmm. Um, So both of those things made me decide to pursue malaria for my research. So could you tell us more about the research you are currently doing now? Sure. So I would say um, I have a bunch of different interests. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them include, I'll talk about sort of our major focus of malaria research right now, which is understanding why there's still malaria transmission, even though there's so many large scale interventions introduced. Mm-hmm. So we've been working on this. We're now entering, oh, about 14 or 15 years of this. Yeah. Um, the first thing that we did was to try to figure out who had malaria infections. So as you know, malaria is a parasite, lives in the blood, and it's transmitted from human to mosquito to human. So we thought, okay, let's look at the humans and see who has malaria infections and who has infections that have gametocytes. And gametocytes are the transmissible form of malaria parasites. It turns out, sort of surprisingly that it's school age children who have the most malaria parasites. And when they have parasites, those parasites are more more likely to form gametocytes, which make them transmissible to mosquitoes. So um, that led us to to think that maybe it's school age children that are responsible for ongoing transmission. This is especially important if you think about it in a sort of sociological context. Children under five are really the target of most of the malaria interventions because they're the kids who die of malaria. And 
as we all know, they're sort of very much under the control of their parents. So if their parents yeah. say sleep under a bed net, they're going to sleep under a bed net. As kids get older, they do their own thing. Um, they um, There might not be enough bed nets for them. And so they're less likely to sleep under a bed net, which means they're exposed to bites of mosquitoes that can then transmit malaria. Uh, for a diagnosis, they might be just given something like Tylenol or ibuprofen and, and wait till the fever goes away. So they're not under bed nets. They're not treated when they're sick, when they're infected, and they probably do transmit a lot of malaria. We're looking at now on a much more sort of basic science level. So we're looking to see, we're collecting mosquitoes that have bitten humans, and we're looking to see the blood in their abdomens. Is that blood who is that blood from? Who did they feed on? Was it school-age children? Was it children under five? Was it adults? Um, and were those mosquitoes infectious? And we're also trying to understand if um, humans develop some sort of immunity to malaria transmission. Oh, that's really interesting. So for our next question, um, what would you say makes malaria most challenging to monitor, prevent, treat, and eradicate? And also, do you think that climate change will affect the transmission of and the way that we approach vector-borne diseases like malaria? Um, so there are a lot of reasons that malaria is such a, a big challenge. Um, and what so, you know, for those of you who are real malaria, malaria people, I'm talking about Plasmodium falciparum, which is the most common cause of malaria and the malaria that's most common in sub-Saharan Africa. There are other forms of malaria which are tricky in their own way, but for Plasmodium falciparum, um, some of the challenges include the fact that most people who have malaria infection, their blood are not sick, so we don't know that they have it there, right? So they can be walking around, they have malaria parasites in their blood, they're bitten by a, a mosquito, and then that mosquito can go and give malaria to a two-year-old who can then get very sick. Um, in the era of COVID, we know all about asymptomatic carriers, right? Yeah. And... Um, in addition, um, unlike thing, some viruses or even other bacteria where if you get it once in your life, you, you never get it again. If you get measles, you will never get measles again. If you get a measles vaccine, you'll probably never get measles. Whereas with malaria, kids get it over and over and over again. That's because the surface of the, the proteins on the surface of infected red blood cells are different in every parasite. So it's a little bit like the COVID spike protein, if it changed every time there was an infection, you would you know, the vaccine would only work partially against most of the most of the most of the infections. So um, natural immunity is only partial. So kids, youngest kids get malaria over and over again. Sometimes they get very, very sick, sometimes they die. Then school age, then as they get older, they can get infections, but either get not so sick or not sick at all. And then even adults can get infected, rarely get sick, but they can still carry around the infection. So immunity is, natural immunity is only partially effective. And then the reason natural immunity is partially effective is the diversity or the variability of the malaria parasites that they express different proteins on surface of infected red blood cells. And so it's sort of tr every single time it'll trick the immune system into not recognizing it. Yeah, I think that's really interesting how it's different from like other diseases where if you get it once, you're not very likely to get it again. I actually know someone who lived in Ghana as a child and she ended up getting it five times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. As kids get it over and over, you know, in, 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 it is, in most malaria endemic countries, it's quite common that kids would get at least once or twice per rainy season, sometimes yeah. more, sometimes a little less. But yeah, it's not, um, yeah, you can get it over and over again. Yeah. So we'd like to discuss and get your opinion on a specific malaria intervention that was implemented in a community in Ghana. Would that be okay? Sure. Okay. So I'm now going to give the listeners a short summary of the intervention. So in this case study, the researchers examined the effectiveness of students as messengers of malaria information in order to reduce the spread. This case study uses an education-based intervention where students are taught about malaria and its prevention methods in school. The students then relay this information to their families and other community members. Teachers were trained over a period of two days about malaria-related information, such as malaria signs, mosquito biology, symptoms, treatment, and prevention. This method was shown to be effective in the areas described in the case study. 
Observations that were only observed in the intervention group are as follows. Misconceptions about malaria having multiple causes improved significantly. More adults began to treat their bed nets with insecticides and parasite prevalence in school children decreased. So now Karina is going to read for us our main idea for today. So in today's episode, we will be discussing the plausible issues of low-income communities, accessibility to schools, and how that can affect the effectiveness of this intervention. Furthermore, how this issue can be addressed. Therefore, do you think this school-based approach is an effective public health intervention, or is there another type or level of intervention you would recommend instead? Great. So um, I think you know, we've actually done something like this in schools, too. I think we called them scouts we had we taught a bunch of kids about malaria and they came up with their own songs and dances and to relay the information to their fellow students so as i mentioned earlier i didn't even think about the fact that this was going to tie in so nicely mm -hmm. school age kids are particularly at risk for not accessing the usual interventions to prevent malaria which is mostly the use of bed nets so um i think in terms of behavior change if we can convince the kids themselves to take agency and use their bed nets and also, you know, encourage their parents to use it, uh, to get one for them and to use the, use it themselves and to use it for their user, use, um, for their younger brothers and sisters. I think that's very valuable in particular, because I think it's a way to access these school age kids who otherwise probably aren't sleeping under bed nets and don't aren't part of the usual campaign of here's who absolutely must sleep in bed nets. And they we give out bed nets to pregnant women and to children under five. We don't give out bed nets to school age kids. So um, I think it's very useful. I think there's one thing I'd like, to, I think to point out is that, and I think it's oh, often overlooked, bed nets are horrible. They're extremely uncomfortable, especially in <laughs> hot settings. They're a real pain in the neck to unfurl, especially when you're in a sort of uh, less formal housing situation where you know you might have one room and that's where you eat and sit around and also sleep. And so you really have to lip, unfurl it. There might not be an actual like bed. It might be because you're just sleeping on the floor. So I really think bed nets are hard to use. Um, and I'm sure we overestimate how many people use bed nets because everyone knows when someone says, do you sleep under bed net? You should say yes. But it's really uncomfortable, especially in these sort of, you know, like poor housing situations and when the weather's really hot. Um, we actually in Malawi found that people said when they used bed nets, they had more bed bugs. Oh, wow. Um, which was really interesting. But all these things sort of, you know, we should really be thinking about what we can develop for people to use in their houses when they sleep that will effectively pr protect them and be convenient to use as opposed to terribly inconvenient to use. So um, I got this idea from a colleague who's a social scientist in, in health behavior, um, who, and I think he's absolutely right, that we need to make whatever we kind of net product we use like much much easier to use so that people use them more regularly so for example with school age children a lot of them sleep outside the house wow. it's hot, especially when it's very hot um and there's no way if you're sleeping outside you're sleeping on a hammock there's just no way to use a bed net yeah be fixed. i agree i think it's really good to point out that like although it is a solution or like an intervention that's being used, it's not always the most convenient. Because so I feel like if you were to look up right now, um, interventions for malaria, bed nets would come up. Mm -hmm. so it's one of the top good. ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then it's also important to think about like the people actually using them and how it kind of fits into their daily lives. I also think it's really interesting when you're talking about the community education, how the students kind of were coming up with their songs kind of presenting the material in an engaging way to them and like I first read the case study that I thought about was how can this intervention like take place in other community settings such as like churches and community centers so in the case study the intervention was shown to be effective in areas where it's implemented but Ghana also has one of the highest rates of elementary school enrollment but like some students might have a difficult time accessing schools depending on where they are so in what ways do you think that school-based community education can take place for these students in areas where schools are not as accessible? 
Yeah. So it's a good question. Um, and of course, the kids who can't make it to school are probably the kids at higher risk for having bad malaria and just bad health outcomes, period. Right. Um, so those are very connected. Some of the um, things that we've thought about in developing school based. I worked more on school based malaria treatment interventions as opposed to educational interventions but um, include, you know, opening activities up to kids, even if they're not enrolled. So you don't have to necessarily be, there's all kinds of reasons kids aren't enrolled in school, but if they could just come for one or two days, then, you know, to make that clear that that's allowed. For the education outcomes, I think sort of, um, for the education programs, I think using the school as the place to organize these groups but then sending them out to access people outside of schools, I think, is the way to go, right? Because, of course, you're right. Not everybody goes to school. Some families have kids that are too young. Some kids have some families have kids that are too old or, you know, the, they're so impoverished that they have to be working to grow food every day. But figuring out how to share the education to those those individuals, I think, was, is very important. It's certainly doable. Yeah, I agree. So something we talked about, and I kind of touched on this, is like having it take place in other community settings like churches. Um, it could be useful in countries where the school enrollments are like not as high. So mm -hmm. the community members would still be able to gain information, but in places that they already frequently attend. And so for this intervention, something that did come up too was the unintended consequences of this intervention. So the children may spread like misinformation, which can be harmful to preventing and treating malaria. If the students like aren't correctly interpreting the information that they're taught, they could spread misinformation, which would cause confusion about the disease and possibly even increase the spread. Yeah, so how would you ensure a lack of misinformation? So how could we prevent that in your opinion? Right. So, well, it's in, it's an interesting question. So, of course, you could just make sure that somebody who is knowledgeable is sort of supervising what the message is. But I think, you know, what's an interesting point, which I think is important, is um, those kids will learn, will know what they learned in there. Maybe they had a, a class and then prepared their presentations. But you could imagine that they could then be viewed as true experts. Um, yeah. similarly, you know, similar to like when I was in my first year medical school and people asked me medical questions, it was sort of tempting to answer as if I knew, but I didn't. Um, so, uh, you know, th that if now they're sort of, oh, you're in this education program, I'm going to ask you this complicated question or this question you don't know the answer to, um, that, that you risk that they are come off as experts in something that they don't know very much about. And I think it's uh, an important thing to recognize and warn against. Yeah, I agree. Uh, thank you for your input. It was extremely insightful. Is there anything else you wanted to add that you think uh, our viewers should know? Um, I think, you know, there's, um, it's important to, and I think everyone in your class is thinking of this, right? To think of as about um, health in a global sense. And as we see more and more infections spread worldwide, that, there's no infections there, but not here. I mean, there was malaria here in the United States in the 1800s. And um, most infections, whether it's the infections themselves or infections like these, um, will, will eventually be found everywhere. So I think it's important to be thinking about communicable diseases and their spread and trying to figure out how to tackle them, develop vaccines and so forth. You did ask a question about climate change. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about malaria and climate change is that it is unclear and and different climate issues push malaria in one direction versus another so for example the world is getting warmer and that means that some areas that were too cold for malaria mosquitoes spreading mosquitoes will be warm enough some areas are going to get to be too hot for malaria spreading mosquitoes rains, enough rain will create more habitats for mosquito larvae, too much rain will wash them away. So if there's any impact of climate change on malaria, it is that everything will become less predictable than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. Great, great.
So in summary, school children are increasingly being recognized as health ambassadors for the fight against malaria. This study's goal was to evaluate the effect of a school-based malaria teaching intervention on students and community members. Accessibility of school to low-income communities might affect the success of this intervention. However, this education can place in other community settings, as we discussed. According to this study, the participatory health education interventions was a factor in the decline in childhood malaria prevalence. The advancement of knowledge and practices had a positive effect on community adults in addition to school-aged children. Children could disseminate false information, which could be detriment detrimental to malaria prevention and treatment, in addition to spreading false information in their communities if they misinter misinterpret the material they taught. However, as Dr. Lawford Insight was um, on this intervention, there are better ways to prevent that from happening, such as, you know, knowledgeable supervisors, as you mentioned. And this is just also more convenient uh, ways to treat malaria than the bed nets, as you were saying. So appreciate your uh, input into this podcast. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Lawford, for meeting with us and sharing your insight on this topic. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you also to our listeners for tuning in, and we hope that everyone has a great rest of their day.